it is five o'clock on the West Coast, and that means that it is time to uh, do the official kickoff for uh, for this whole thing. So, uh, welcome everybody to the um, Vancouver Power BI and Modern Excel User Group Meetup. My name is Ken Pulse. I'm the host, and uh, today we're going to be having my good friend Kurt Fry join us to uh, talk a little bit about simulating process in Excel with minimal pain. But before we get to Kurt's presentation, I just want to go through and do our usual of you know thanking sponsors and all that kind of good stuff. So, um, I have a couple of notes that I just want to run through here, which should take us to about five minutes after the hour or so, and then Kurt will be on for an hour-ish, however long he decides uh, he needs to, uh, to run through his presentation. Um, as always, uh, the Vancouver Power BI Modern Excel User Group is sponsored by Skillwave.Training, which is my training company, um, Excel Guru being the parent company of that, and also the company who distributes Monkey Tools, which is my Excel add-in that uh, if you are working um, in Excel or with Power Query and Power Pivot, you should definitely know about. As a matter of fact, I'm going to take the time to tell you about something really quick in that regard in just a second. It's our a next wonderful two, thing. Thank you. Appreciate that, Melinda. Um, coming up in uh, our next two meetups, uh, we've got my good friend Matt Allington is going to be coming um, for our next meetup on June 22nd uh, in our Power BI track. And he's going to be talking about the difference between sum and sum X. Why the heck they actually, why would that matter? Um, so that's going to be awesome. And then we're going to be next month welcoming a new speaker to uh, Van Pug, which is fantastic. Um, I'm probably going to pronounce his last name wrong, but uh, Alex Kolokolov is going to be coming and giving us a, a presentation which sounds terrifying, Dashboard Cemetery Walk. Um, so how to design dashboard to survive the corporate world. Uh, it sounds like it's going to be a fantastic uh, presentation uh, based on the, the write-up that he sent us. Um, so we're really looking forward to seeing that. Um, I do want to just throw out a quick uh, little note here for those of you who are using Monkey Tools or those of you who have not yet used Monkey Tools and really should be. Um, on June 2nd, I uh, actually released um, another new update for Monkey Tools. Uh, we've done a couple of things over the past month here. The first thing is that we've added a new from table or range monkey. This has enhanced control T and get data from table or range experience. It's the first feature that I have released that actually takes a default feature of Microsoft and enhances it to actually make it work better the way that I felt that it always should have worked. This allows you to name your tables when you're creating them instead of having to go back and name them afterwards, uh, which is a really important thing. And I'll give you a very quick demo of this in just a second. It also works with named ranges and spilled uh, dynamic arrays, gives you the option to create a connection only query at the same time, things that should always have been in that dialogue. Uh, in addition to this, we've got new options for our BiblioMonkey uh, menu for, or BiblioMonkey database for formulas specifically. You can now inject them directly into your worksheet uh, via the cell context menu as well, rather than having to go into the BiblioMonkey to do it. Makes it a little bit easier. And we've also expanded language compatibility for Monkey Tools. Um, what this means is it now runs in international configurations. And this is a really, really interesting thing for me to deal with because if you now have a user who is running a, say, Swedish operating system with a German version of Excel, Monkey Tools will now work. It didn't actually used to. Um, so that's kind of a, a cool little thing. Um, I'm gonna show you just really quickly a demo of the table or range feature set that we actually have here. Uh, so you can see here, I've got some tabular data with headers. In the normal world, when you press control T, you get a dialog that gives you about this much information. So we now have the ability right off the bat to say that this is my table. We can name it right up front. I can't spell table though. Um, and you can actually also create a connection only query. So if we go and connect that right away, uh, you'll see that it goes and formats it and the connection only query comes up right off the bat. This is a dynamic array here that's got a spill range. If I go right click, for example, and say, hey, I'd like to get data from table or range, it will pull up the same thing and allow you to define a named range at either a workbook or a worksheet level to actually grab that dynamic array. And then when you go and pull that in, it will then launch you directly into Power Query. Your named range is already set up with a name that you like rather than having to live with a default named range, which you then change and break all your Power Query. So it's kind of a cool new feature um, along the way. Uh, one other thing I want to show you really quickly here, I'm just going to go and put in a date here and I'm going to uh, make all these columns a little bit wider because we have to do that. Let me format this as a date here for a second. Do, do, do. I'll go put that as yellow. Um, so one of the other features that we have in BiblioMonkey is that we can actually go and set up patterns of formulas and replace them with variables. And you can now see that from here, if I go and say, hey, I'd like to insert a formula here for a end of next month formula, for example. Uh, I can now go and say, I'd like to base it off of this guy here, increment it by one month and inject it and boom, it just shows up 
in all the places with a nice relative formula all built. So just a couple of quick new features uh, in order to deal with this. Where do I find the time to do all this? Um, that's a great question. I, I'm not actually sure. I spend my evenings and weekends working on these things because they're just awesome and fun. So there you go. Um, awesome. Any anyway, rate, that's some of the new stuff in Bibli or in Monkey Tools. Uh, I should also point out that everything that's on this slide is available in the free version of Monkey Tools. You do not have to have a paid pro license in order to use these. If you haven't checked it out yet, you should definitely do so. You can find out, uh, you can get the installers at monkeytools.ca. A um, couple of things I do want to uh, just throw out there really quickly as well. If you're looking for some good training on uh, Excel Fundamentals, my Excel Fundamentals Bootcamp, which is about 32 hours of training plus uh, up to, oh, what does it work, 23 training, uh, two-hour Ask Me Anything sessions per year, office hours, uh, twice a month where you can ask anything and I'll help you build your solutions. Uh, that product, um, we have another intake that's going to be going on June 14th, uh, so it's not too late to sign up. This is where we teach you about Excel formulas, pivot tables, Power Query data visualization. So you get a good breadth of how to upskill and, and make sure that you're at a good uh, good level for Excel to impress your boss. Uh, ideal is to say for people who want to learn pivot tables and increase formula reporting skills. We also, on June 14th, have another semester of my self-service BI bootcamp kicking off. This is probably one of the most intense programs that I have. We use Excel, Power Query, Power BI, um, Power Pivot, uh, DAX formulas, all kinds of good stuff here. Again, with um, Ask Me Anything sessions or Ask Can Anything sessions uh, along the way um, as well. Another fantastic program. You should definitely check that out. Um, and I appreciate Melinda throwing into the chat. Uh, it's a fabulous course. She is as one of the uh, one of the, the people that we actually have in it, and um, she can tell you it's a, it's a lot of fun to be part of. Uh, the Every VanPug meetup that we have is recorded. We actually share those through the SkillWave YouTube channel. I post the recording within the next 24 to 48 hours after it's over, and you can find all of his, our historical content here. By the way, the slide deck is already posted to the meetup site, so you can download it to get all of these links, which I'm running through at high speed. Uh, if you're interested in bite size uh, training, these are three minute or less content uh, videos that are very, very targeted on our monkey shorts on our Still Wave YouTube channel. Uh, definitely go and check those out. Some cool tricks that, uh, that you can learn to just help you make you a little bit more efficient here. Last thing I'm going to say before I step aside and give the floor to Kurt here is that if you would like to come and actually speak to VanPug, tell us something cool and interesting about Excel or Power BI or anything in the Power Platform that you're building, we love new speakers. Just fill out the survey. We'll get in touch with you, and we'd love to get you on our stage. And on that note, Kurt, that's my bit. So now it's your turn, my friend. All right. Thank you very much, Ken. And no worries. Yep. I'm uh, you know, I was excited to get this uh, this invitation to uh, to speak. Most of everything that I do these days is recorded as opposed to live. So this will be an interesting experience for all of us. <laughs> and uh, I am an, a professional improvisational comedian in addition to being a speaker and an Excel guy. So I'm not afraid for things to go wrong. I'll try to fix them as we go along. So Excel, yeah. Excel is uh, incredibly versatile and incredibly powerful, but you sort of have to be pushed in the right direction for what exactly it is that you want to do. And this evening, um, and I'll switch over to PowerPoint, deals with process simulation. Oh, I'll go back to the start. Here, Kurt, just so you know, you haven't actually shared your screen yet. So that's one of those uh, fun live technical glitches for you to work through right off the bat. Yeah. Well, it's a good thing I don't actually care. Okay. <laughs> Entire screen. Share. All right. Now you should be seeing yourselves. We indeed go. I can see John anyway. There you go. Yeah, there we are. There we go. Now we're on process simulation. So the goals that I have for this evening are to set up a, a worksheet for a one station process. And the idea is that you have customers or jobs or whatever arriving with a known average interval. If you are putting them through one station, then you can create a simulation table that gives you information about how things can go. And more importantly, how things can go wrong because we will be calculating delays. We'll create summary calculations and then we will extend the worksheet to two stations and i'll show you how to do that and the techniques that i show you there can be extended to three four multiple stations your worksheet basically just keeps getting wider 
And then finally, as required by American law, I will try to sell you something. So quick overview. We're going to model the time between arrivals and service time. And both are based on an average value, which in the literature is referred to as lambda, the Greek letter lambda. The arrival time is modeled using the Poisson distribution. And yes, that was the name of the guy who, um, who discovered it and formalized it. And service time is modeled using the exponential distribution. These two distributions of numbers are related to each other. And I'll show you graphically what those look like. So you don't you know, need to understand the calculus behind it because fun fact, I don't. And the target audience is the service industry, the typical use or the, um, uh, the usual example is a sandwich shop, but it applies just about anywhere else where you have a process with an arrival time and a service time. So here are what the Poisson and, and exponential distributions look like with a lambda, or again, that's the average of five. And that could be five minutes, it could be five ticks of the clock, however you choose to define it. And what I want to point out is that the Poisson distribution, which is in orange, and it's the one that reaches up to one first, it tends to go up very quickly and have what I would think of as a very short tail. So it is unlikely that you would have an inter-arrival gap, as they call it, of more than about 10 minutes or 10 ticks of the clock. Whereas with the exponential distribution, which is the lower curve, that can uh, that has a very long tail. So you tend to have larger numbers more frequently. And you see that even if you have an average service time of five, it is unfortunately likely that you will see a number, a service time of 20 minutes or more. And just based on your own experience in lines at the bank, at the, what in the US we call the division of motor vehicles and elsewhere, that is entirely possible. So I'm going to switch over to Excel and we can, take a look at how the Poisson versus exponential change based on the average. So we have the lambda up here in G1 of five and the curves that we saw before. And if I were to change the average to three, then the curves get closer together. And you can see that it's very unlikely that we will have a service time of more than 15 and the inter-arrival time stays more or less the same. However, let's take a look at what happens when we increase the average. So we are previously at five, I'll go to seven. And you can see that we're getting times of 25 minutes or more with increasing frequency. And if I switch the average to 10, then this starts to look extremely ugly. So we're. Uh, it looks like from here that 30% of the time, or rather with 30 minutes, we will, yes, yeah, so we have 0.95. So that means that about 5% of the time, we will have a service time of greater than 30 minutes, even though the average is only 10. So what we're looking at here is how the changes in lambda will affect the process. So I apologize if this has been um, a little bit, you know, mathematically detailed and, you know, I assume this audience can handle it because you're, you're power users. So I'm not too worried about that. It's just a little bit beyond what most folks ask me to go into. So let's switch over to the first page of our worksheet which I have here on arrivals, and we can start calculating the arrival gap. So the first thing you do is estimate the time between arrivals by observing your process. And this is literally just sitting around with a clipboard and a clock and figuring out what your average arrival gap is. So we'll start with zero in cell A5. And then the probability of that happening is zero. We are assuming, in other words, that we don't have two people walking at the same time, or if we do, we can serve them together. 
that assumption may or may not be valid. We'll use it this time to keep it simple. So now in cell B6, or excuse me, in cell A6, I'm going to type a one, then a two, and I'll extend the series down using the fill handle until we get to 10. So we're looking at arrival gaps from one minute to 10 minutes. And this is based on analyses that I've done before. So I know that it will cover most of our possibilities. Then in B6, I'm going to generate the probability that we will see an inter-arrival gap of one or less. So I've already typed equal, then we'll use Poisson.dist. That's the new version of the function. The X we'll be using is in A6 and a comma. And the average or lambda is in A2. I don't want that, I don't want that to change when I copy it, so I'll press F4. Ah. I didn't have my function keys turned on. I am doing this on a laptop for the first time. Probably silly, so we have F4, there we go. Then a comma and true. We want a cumulative distribution function. So I'll press tab to accept that, parentheses and enter. And I'm going to take a quick drink of tea. My allergies are terrible. Pollen in the Portland area has just been hideous the last couple of days. <clears throat> Pardon me. Okay. Now I can copy the formula down. So I'll click cell B6. And because it's next to a column of data, I can double click the fill handle. And it goes down to cell B15. So the probability of getting 10 minutes or less is basically 900 or 9,997 times out of 10,000. So three out of 10,000 times, we'll see a value greater than 10. For me, that's close enough to one. So I will replace the value in B15 with the one and then press tab. And the reason I do that is when we generate random values later using the rand function, that generates decimal values between zero and one inclusive. So I want to start at zero and I want to end at one. That's the reason for that. Okay, so that's good there. I will move on to my next worksheet, which I already have set up. And I will increase the zoom level so it's a little easier to see. Right, so now we're looking at service times. And again, instead of using the Poisson distribution, we're going to use the related but different exponential distribution. So starting in cell E2, I need to take one over the average service time. That's what's used as the lambda input into exponential. So I'll type equal, just one. One divided by E2 and enter, and we get 0.5. Now the rest of this will look familiar. So with the service time in D5, I'll type a zero. And in D6, I'll type a one. And then to start out, I will extend down until I see the value of 10. There we go. And then for the probability, once again, we're going to be using exponent.dist. So I'll type equal, xpon.dist. The X is the value in D5, so I'll click there. Then a comma, lambda is in E2. So again, it's not the average time, it's the reciprocal. So there, and then F4 to make it an absolute reference, then comma, and we do want the cumulative distribution, which we'll use later in our X lookup. Then we have true, right parentheses and enter. And I'll go ahead and double click the fill handle to copy down. So when I look at the last value next to a service time of 10, I see that about seven times out of a thousand, I will get a value that is greater than 10 minutes for the service time. And if you're working with a significant number of customers, then a thousand people will come through quite frequently. 
So I actually want to extend this a little bit. And instead of staying with 10 minutes, I'll go down to 14. And again, I only know this because I actually rehearsed. Try not to act so surprised, Ken. There we go. I'll make it a little lower. And here I have 14 minutes or more, about one out of a thousand. For the purposes of this exercise, I will make that a one and assume that all service times are between zero and 14 minutes. If I were to actually see anything that was greater than that, then I can always expand the range. Okay, so this has been the mathematical hand wavy part of it where I've created lookup tables that we can use for the simulation for arrival gap and for service times. So I think this would be a good time to pause for questions. Uh, all right. The only question I got for you, I think, so far is that uh, John Peltier wants to know why you're not using the sequence function and why you're manually dragging uh, dragging numbers down. <laughs> These because MVPs, I'm, they're incredible critics. <laughs> because I am the least efficient Excel user that you will ever meet. <laughs> there you go. That's a good reason. Uh, listen, it gets it done, right? That's the important part. Yeah, so, it does. Ken, ha Ken has a great course, Excel Fundamentals, starting soon. <laughs> Exactly. Uh, yeah. Um, no, I think that was the. I think that was the only uh, only question that we actually had in the chat. I don't know if anybody else has a question that they want to throw out there. Um, please, uh, please feel free to do so. Um, but outside of that, um, okay. Uh, all right. All right. I will go ahead. So I'll start sharing again. Well, I'll see John again. You're a handsome man, John Peltier. All right. So we have all this set up. Now we can go over to the start of our simulation table. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the idea is that we want to create a list of customers and then calculate for this part the arrival gap. And we'll generate that using uh, using the Poisson distribution, and then calculate the arrival time. And then I can't remember if I do the start time on this one. Uh, no, I save that for the next worksheet. So it looks like we'll be going just up through arrival time. And actually, I'll run through um, all of the headers so we have kind of a roadmap of where we're going to go. So I've got the customer number, and I will I refuse to um, to use sequence for that. Then I have the arrival gap, the arrival time, which is calculated based on the arrival gap and also the previous arrival gap, if necessary. Then the start time when we actually start serving someone, and it can be different from their arrival time. We'll see that. Then we have the service time, the end time, the wait time, which is the gap between the arrival time and the start time, and then total time that a customer spends in the system. So I'll scroll back over. And again, because we're doing lookups, I want you to be able to see this lookup table here so we can verify that the results we get are correct. All right, so I will start by entering zeros into row six. So then zero, and actually this is the one efficiency that I use. You select all the cells, type in, a value into the active cell, control enter, and it enters the same value or formula into all of the selected cells. So yes, I guess I do I do this one thing efficiently. So now I will enter one into the seven, and then drag down because I'm stubborn that way. 13 customers. And now we can calculate our first arrival gap. And this is going to be done using XLOOKUP, which I don't need to praise in front of this crowd because you know exactly why it's so much better than, um, than VLOOKUP. So I have XLOOKUP. And then the lookup value is going to be a random decimal value between 0 and 1. So that's just the rand function. 
open and close parentheses, nothing in between them, and then a comma. Now we need to use our lookup array. And the lookup array is going to be from B5 through B15. So what we're looking for is a probability. And again, it's a cumulative probability. And we're going to be looking for a value that is equal to or greater than the value that is generated by the RAND function. And yes, it does mean that your spreadsheet will be volatile. So you would need to use something like VBA or manually copying values to accumulate um, uh, simulation runs as we go along. I don't go into that here, but it's something that can be done fairly straightforwardly. So I've got B5 through B15. I don't want that changing when I copy the formula. So F4, there we go. Then a comma, the lookup values will be to the left, which is why we can't use VLOOKUP, although we could just rearrange the formulas and it would work just fine. So we have A5 through A15, which is the arrival gap that we're looking for as the return value. Then F4, then a comma. I don't need to use the next argument if not found, because it will be found. I have zero and one as a hard boundary around it. So comma, and then we're looking for an exact match. Oh, I said next larger earlier. So we're going to use one. So we have exact match or next larger item. That is number one, right parentheses and enter. So the first arrival gap is going to be two minutes. And if I press F9, it changes to one, changes to four, four again, then two, then three, then four, and you get the idea. The arrival time is, <clears throat> excuse me. Right, so the arrival time will be the arrival gap, which we just calculated in H7, plus the arrival time of the previous customer. So that will be equal I6, the previous arrival time, plus H7. And I'll press tab. So we have a customer arriving three minutes after the initial arrival time of zero, so that's three. And if I copy these formulas down, you can see how it works in practice. So we have arrival gap of one, starting from arrival time, previous arrival time of zero for customer one. Then for customer two, we have an arrival gap of three and an arrival gap or an arrival time of four because it is three minutes after the previous arrival time. Right, so that is it for here. And now we can go to the next part of the simulation table. So I've already put in values for customers one through 13. And you can see that I have the zeros up top so that I can work with numbers. And I have arrival times that have been generated randomly using XLOOKUP and RAND in column H. So I will scroll over and I'll copy over my zeros. Not using sequence again, just to prove a point. So then we have the start time. Now the start time is when a customer is actually receiving a service within the system. So that will be that will be the max, the larger of two values. So that will be I7, which will be the customer's arrival time, or L6, which is the previous customer's end time, plus one. So if there, we're assuming that we can only handle one customer at a time. So if we have not yet reached the previous customer's end time, then this customer has to wait until the previous customer has been released from the system. So in cell J7, I'll type equal, max, I7, 
comma, L6 plus one, pardon me. So again, we have that and I'll press tab to move over to the right. So hopefully that's clear. If not, um, if you could let Ken know in the chat and I will go over, uh, go over it one more time. Not hearing anything, so I think we are good. So now we need to calculate a customer's service time. And this will come from the values here that we generated using the exponential distribution. And it'll look almost exactly the same as the Poisson X lookup uh, that we did, or as the um, X lookup that we did before. It's just we're using a different set of values. So in K7, I'll type equal X lookup. And again, rand to generate that random decimal value between zero and one. And E5 through E19. F4 to make the range reference absolute. Then D5 through D19, F4 again, then a comma. Two commas because I didn't want I didn't need to use if not found, and then one exact or next larger item. And write parentheses and tab. So everything looks good so far. That is just the service time. And then the customer's end time for the process, not overall, is the start time plus the service time. So we have equal J7 plus K7 and tab. A customer's wait time is the difference between the time that they arrive and the time that they start. So I have equal and that will be L7. Excuse me, I jumped ahead. One, so that will be J7, which is their start time, minus their arrival time, which is in I7. And then tab. And you can see the first customer, of course, has no wait time because there was no one in line in front of them. And then the total time is the total time they spend in the system. So that will be their end time minus their arrival time. So I have equal L7 minus J7. End time, oops, sorry, that should be I7. And enter. Now I can copy my formulas down. And we can see what it looks like. Oops. Misclick there. So I'll reselect. Double click, and there we go. And you can see, if I scroll back over, that we have an average arrival gap of three and an average service time of two. Now we have our average arrival gap larger than the average service time, which is great. That means that this process is feasible, that it's not going to self-destruct pretty much automatically. However, if we scroll over and take a look at the values that were generated, we'll see that we have some pretty significant wait times. So we start out at zero, of course, but then it goes quickly up to 15 minutes or 15 ticks to the clock, whatever, up to a maximum of 21. And that's even though we have service times that are mostly ones and threes and ones and twos, but then we see the problem. We have a service time of 12. And that causes just a cascade of weights behind it. And this is the reason that this type of simulation for any sort of customer service or similar process is so valuable. And that's because you can identify where the problems in the system are coming from. So if you have a customer that's
customer or maybe even have their photo on a board um, in the manager's office, then you know that someone is going to require more time and a manager or another employee can come out and allow that customer to be taken to one side and worked with in a parallel as opposed to just this linear process. So this is another place that I had set aside. For, for any questions that have come up. I don't have any questions in the chat right now, Kurt, um, but if anybody wants to, uh, to fire one in or ask for some clarification on anything, uh, now is a great time to do that. Um, yeah. Feel free to unmute and ask if it's easier than typing, but, uh, but whatever, uh, whatever works best for you. All right, All right. I'll wait for a second while I drink some tea. No, I am going once, going twice. All right, I'm sold. Time to move on to the next customer. All right, then. Well done. Nice sub reference. So, entire screen. Trying to get the content here. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. So, I'll get away from John Han John's handsome face. There we go. All right. And then I will go to my summary. Like that and summary. There we are. So if I scroll over to the right, you can see that I have a different table because again, these numbers are being generated randomly than I had before. And if I press F9 to recalculate the worksheet, then I can see that I have wait times, total times, and so on. Oh, and it looks like actually for these total times that I made the mistake that I had in my notes where instead of subtracting, I subtracted the start time from the end time. So there we go. And a copy down. There we are. Okay. So that includes the wait times. Glad I caught that. So now I can create summaries that I would um, use to analyze this process as a whole. And I'll just go through these fairly quickly because they're pretty straightforward as far as formulas goes. For the total wait time, that is the sum of all my wait time values. So M6 through M19. Then the average arrival gap will be equal average, and that's, oh, actually I want to do, I don't want to include the zero at the start because that will throw off the average. So that will be M7. And then the average wait time is equal average. M7 through M19 and enter. And one thing I'll do, um, oh, I put it in the wrong uh, wrong cell. Arch arrival gap. There we go, and enter. So I have an average arrival gap of three. And just to make sure that my worksheet is performing um, as hoped, I can compare that with the average arrival gap in cell A2. And this again is what I've observed about the process. So I'll do F9 again. Got an average of 3.38, three on the dot, three, 3.07, 2.9, 2.15. So there is some variation, but it's not out of line um, with what I've measured before. If I do start to see arrival gaps that are different from three in the real world, then I would definitely want to reevaluate the process. So I will scroll over and then back. The average wait time is equal. M7 to, or 
sorry, it should be average. Always remember the function. M7 to M19. And the latest end time will be the max. of L7 through L19. And I would use the latest end time. For example, if I wanted to know typically how long it would take me to get through 20, 25, 50, or 100 customers, then I could expand my table. So I had 100 or however many customers, and then draw the end time from the simulation for that. So again, it's the kind of thing that one run won't tell you anything, but a lot of them probably would. The average service time is equal. And then we have K7 through K19, then are right parentheses. So the average service time as calculated is 2.8. And you can see that we got some pretty serious wait times as we go along. And if I do F9 a couple of times again, then we get 2.2, 2.7, 2.8. So it looks like our service times are tending. OK, so it was just a statistical anomaly where we had a bunch of average service times that were over two. And those are starting to smooth out. And we're getting a bunch more. Ooh, average service time of four, that's horrible. Ah, now we're back to something a little more reasonable. And the average total time in the system is equal, average. Of N7 through N19 and tab. So this simulation run that we had here has almost no wait time. And the total time that individuals spend in the system is quite reasonable. And that's not surprising because our average service time is 1.8, so below 2. And the average arrival gap is above our uh, the average measure of 3. All right, so this is how you would create a simulation table for an individual, uh, you know, for a one station process. If you want to go up to two stations, then you need to change the sheet a little bit. So I'll switch over to my two stations worksheet and I will um, make this workbook available um, through Ken. So, uh, you know, you'll be able to download it. And also at the end, I have a finished finished sheet. So if you just want to see the results, you don't have to type them all in by yourself. So we'll go up to two stations and I will just describe what we have here so far. Scroll over to the left and we've got the average arrival gap and average service time for station one as presented before. And then below we have the average service time for station two. And what I assume is that this is just basically a mandatory but quick process, such as uh, being checked out just to make sure you're there, perhaps take a payment. And the average service time is one for the second station. And of course, the reciprocal of that is just one. And we have a second service time and probability lookup table that you see here. And the reason um, that I stopped at eight minutes is the same as before. It looks like only one out of 1,000 customers will need more than eight minutes. So that's why I left it there. All right, so I will scroll back up and scroll to the right to see the rest of the table. So I've got my 13 customers here. Arrival gaps, arrival time are the same as before, except that now I have relabeled what was be originally start time and start time one, same for service time, end time, and wait time. And now we can start looking at 
similar things for start time number two. And for that, we will be using, scrolling back over, the service time table that I created for the second station. Start time two is the greater of a customer's end time one, so the value they get out, or the time they get out of station one, plus one, or the end start time, uh, excuse me, or the end time plus two of the previous customer. Uh, end time two plus one of the previous customer. The nomenclature that I'm using um, <laughs> just tripped me up. So I'm going to start again. So, so no one is confused, including me. Start time two is the greater of a customer's end time one. That is the time they get out of station one plus one. We're assuming that it takes one minute or one tick to move between stations or end time two plus one of the previous customer. So you can't move into the station until the previous customer has gone through it. So we need to take the maximum of those two values into account. So in N7, I'll type equal, and it's the max of L7 plus one. And again, that's N time one, or the end time of station two, which is in P6, plus one of the previous customer. Then I'll type a right parentheses and tab. Now we need to calculate service time two. So I'll type equal. And again, this will be an X look an X lookup that uses RAND. So X lookup, RAND with open and closed parentheses and nothing in between. The lookup array is E25 through E33 and F4 again to make it an absolute range reference that won't change. And then the values that we're looking up, the return array is D25 through D23, F4. Then a comma. We don't have to worry about not finding the value because we have zero and one. So we have accounted for all values, then a comma, and then a one, because we're looking for exact or next larger. By parentheses and enter. And there we get the value for service time two. End time two, which is in column P, so I'm looking at P7, is uh, start time two plus service time two. So that will be N seven plus plus would be more useful. O seven. Equal sign would be even more useful. So there we go. And I'll scroll over a bit. Wait time two is similar to what we had before. It is start time two, <clears throat> excuse me, it's start time two minus end time one minus one. So again, we assume it takes a minute to move between stations and we don't want to count that against the process. So that will be equal. N7, start time two. minus L7, which is N time one. So that's the gap between the two processes, minus one, and then tab. For R7, we can calculate the total time in the system. So it'll be P7 equal P7, N time two, minus I7, which is the original arrival time, and then tab. And then total service time in S7 is equal. A7, service time one, plus O7, service time two, and then tab. And total wait time in T7 is equal M7, 
plus Q7, both our wait times, and enter. And then I will select the cells that I just filled in with formulas, double click the fill handle, and there we go. So if we take a look at the process, just with the values that we have in front of us, we can see that the total time in the system as compared to total service time stays fairly in balance until we have a long service time. And if I look back, I see that the first service time that's have a service time of seven. And you can see that total wait time goes up significantly after that. or rather total time of the system goes up and total wait time goes up slightly, but there are ways to correct it later in the process, basically later in the day as customers come through. So once again, the idea is to use this type of a simulation to identify where the problems come and to figure out ways as part of your analysis and knowledge of the business process, how you can fix it. And that is all that I have here. So I'm going to switch back to PowerPoint and end up. So first I will go with my uh, contact information. My email for this purpose is cfry at techsoc.com. And if you want to buy the full course, including queuing analysis, where you do an analytical look as opposed to a, to a simulation look, at queuing processes. You can buy it for $899 or $1100. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. There we go. For $8.99 US, or and that works out to about $1199 Canadian. But honestly, those are just guide prices. I want to make this available to everyone. So it's actually pay what you will. Um, with $8.99 or $11.99 Canadian as uh, maximums. So don't worry you know, too much about that. And yes, if pay what you will is zero, then just send me an email and I will send you the Dropbox download link to the course. I prefer to work through PayPal, um, especially with Canadian customers, but we can work out something else if needed. If you want to find me on LinkedIn, you can go to um, the URL that you see here, but my username is Curtis Fry, and you can find me fairly easily there. That's one of the nice things about getting in about 10 years ago, and at the start of a social media platform, you can almost always get your own name. And Curtis Fry isn't that common, but you would be surprised the number of people who share that name and are on LinkedIn, and I got there before them, ha. Huh. And also look for my courses on LinkedIn Learning. I have a lot of courses currently in the supply chain realm. So if you're looking at analyzing transportation problems using Solver or other things along those lines, then you can find them there. You might have access through your company, a personal subscription, or for your library, which is a wonderful way to get in. So if you, if you have access any of those ways, I would appreciate it if you would take a look for me. And with that, I will switch back and I will stop sharing. And I am open to any questions. All right, we got some questions for you now. So great. Um, so uh, I'm gonna let's let's start with the easy one first here. Uh, John was asking the the last uh, last simulation that you had there. Um, was this more of a multiple lines of tellers doing the same thing, or more like the DMV where you have to go through multiple steps? I'm feeling it was the latter. Correct. It was a, it's a, a linear sequence where you cannot move on to step two um, until you are finished with step one. I think there's a comment in here that the DMV wait time should be longer. Um, Melinda wants to your spreadsheet so she can take it to the ER or that she recently visited her with her husband because plainly they need to do some analysis in this area. Um, <laughs> uh, okay, so now uh, actually that is... Uh, oh, he's got a book on this one. 
Yeah, there, well, there, actually, there are a couple of books. And uh, Melinda, if you reach out to me at cfrytechsesh.com, I can give you a couple of very specific recommendations for process analysis specific to um, the healthcare industry. Yeah, I, I doubt they would uh, read it or do anything with it. <laughs> no, but you can throw it in their face. And there is a certain level of satisfaction. <laughs> the cynicism is amazing, isn't it? Yeah, I, I would have <laughs> if I'd have had it the last time, I'll tell you. I'm just getting started, man. You know me. Anyway. <laughs> um, yeah, it was hey, uh, 26 and a half hours from arriving mm. at the ER to being admitted to the hospital. Yikes. That's a, that's an awful long time. Um, and not unusual in healthcare either, as it seems. But yeah. uh, um, so listen, I wanted to ask you a question. So John and I were having a discussion just around uh, around your observations with the recalculation of your sample sizes, um, particularly when you were you know doing a, a your calculation was coming up you know plus or minus on the three minute side and whatnot. So you're using 13 different observations there, or a sample size of 13 people or or whatnot. That's obviously not enough to get a real picture out of things. Yeah, what right. would you say a, an approximate statistically significant sample would actually be? How many observations should you have? Well, you should probably take a look at, you should, one of the reasons that I calculate the, the maximum end time is that, uh, Melinda, are you, are you still on? No, I think uh, I'm. I think that's actually John. So I'm just going to uh, mercilessly mute him right now, and uh, okay. he can always unmute in, in a minute. <laughs> so. Great. Um, so, what, so actually, that's a really good question. One of the reasons that I and sorry for defaming you, Melinda. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> one of the reasons that I calculate um, max end time, the largest end time value, is so that I get a sense of what the end of the day can look like. So if I am, so there's 60 minutes in an hour. And if you're looking at minutes, then you can do a, a number of runs and see when the last customer tends to arrive. And so if they arrive before you close, then technically you should serve them. Or at least that's, that's most of the, uh, you know, that's most of the uh, business practice that I've seen. So that's the first part of the question. Uh, first part of my answer is to look at how many um, road, how many customers you need to account for usually. Then, how many simulations do you run? As many as you can. And I would say probably uh, for a day, if, if you were looking at one day's worth of customers coming in, I would say start at 10,000 because there are you know, so many different um, possibilities uh, between arrival times and service times that you need to be able to account for them and kind of smooth out all the differences. And this is where Visual Basic comes in, uh, VBA comes in. You need to, to find a way to automate that process. And one of my LinkedIn learning courses actually shows you how to create the VBA code for this. And it's not particularly difficult, it's something you know, that um, someone who knows VBA could do easily in an afternoon. But it is important that you have a large number of trials so that you don't you don't fall prey to the, you know, to the anomalies that we saw when I was running through the example. Fair enough. Um, I just want, I probably should have actually asked you this earlier, but uh, just to clarify on this one too, the uh, the start or the uh, arrival time versus the the start time. I assume the arrival time is the time someone joins the back of the line to wait for service. Correct. Okay, there you go. Yeah, and then um, I saw someone just ask, why not use Monte Carlo? This is Monte Carlo. Yeah. There you go. All right, John's unmuted himself, which means that he must have a question or a comment or both. Um. Well, actually. When we were looking at when he presses the F9 and you, you get a wide variation in the average service time over 13 customers, and that's you know not a realistic thing. But as he says, you, you you figure out what's a typical number of customers that come in or what's a typical end time for this many customers. And uh, where you really get your statistical robustness is by running your 10,000 simulations. And that's the Monte Carlo aspect of it. And you could possibly even build this into uh, 
like uh, data tables, the old fashioned tables and, and do that. Um, mm -hmm. I, I've done that in the past, probably not for 12 or 15 years, but. That's the way I was taught to do this in my um, in my MBA program. Yeah. And of course, with VBA, you don't have to deal with the, the data table issues. Um, and if, if all you're doing is you're capturing the the averages or the, the latest uh, end time or things like that, then that just goes into a table and you don't care about the intermediate results. So, I mean, I've done the same thing when I'm looking at how long a certain process takes and uh, I want to make sure it's not going to be uh, too tedious for the user. Like, how long does it take to export a chart as an image file? And I'll run through simulations and I'll I'll I'll, I'll do like a hundred exports, and then that hundred export block I'll repeat a hundred times and look at it that way, just to kind of smooth out the the variation. And a hundred times a hundred is ten thousand. Yeah. Okay. Well, there you go. So. Um, <laughs> And, I'm going to send so, you guys my power query to time. I got one that I need to run 30 trials. It's going to take nine hours. And I'm like, nine okay, 10,000 trials, not a freaking chance. Nope. Not gonna happen. No way. Right. <laughs> <laughs> check your, so, check your query order. Maybe you're not uh, narrowing the first part down enough. <laughs> no, no, that, that's, that's the point though. Right? Like, and you're trying to, you're trying to figure out some of these things and, and figure out what that timing discrepancy is. Is how many times do you do a refresh to try it out, to figure out what is that, that variation. And uh, you know, it's the problem is that the program is slow to begin with right so right it's a it's make a sure your cpu thing, cooler so. is up to it uh yeah exactly don't leave it on the <laughs> laptop and go to bed right <laughs> so <laughs> there you go <laughs> anyhow um do we have any other questions for kurt at all or any any comments or uh, or anything um please uh, feel free to uh, to ask uh, again you can either unmute and ask in person or use the chat whichever uh, whichever works um okay. you know take uh, take advantage of the time um again, this is mark minnesota Hey, how you doing? Uh, hi to the monkey in the back. <laughs> <laughs> Always got to say hi to the monkey. Oh, there you go. Uh, I, I just wanted to say I've taken your courses on uh, LinkedIn Learning. Uh, great stuff. So I'll be looking uh, to reach out to you and, and pay your $8.99 and uh, see how that one works out. So thanks for sharing today. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you. And uh, one thing for, um, you know, for Ken and, and the team, if you think this was useful, please let them know. If you don't think it was useful, also let them know so he never subjects you to it again. <laughs> oh, this was this was great. <laughs> Ken always puts on a great show, so yeah, good stuff, but, Kurt. Thanks for it, this was good. You're welcome. For me, I'm I fine. can't thank speak you. for anybody else. <laughs> thank you. It's funny. I'll say on a personal basis, Kurt, this is not kind of, not a kind of analysis that I've ever done before, despite working in the food and beverage industry and whatever else. And yet the whole time that you're actually going through this, I'm thinking my kid right now is working at a concession stand and they have actually just switched out what they sell um, due to the amount of time that it took to prep it. And I'm thinking, man, and this just tells you what kind of a geek I am. I'm like, I wonder if I can sit down there with a clipboard one day and actually count the times and then whatever else that people come in. No, this is, that's wrong. That's not the kind of thing a dad should do, but it, it's like, you know, you start thinking about it. It's like, I can see where the application of the process comes in and how it actually would affect things. Um, they're, they're in a fortunate place that they are a captain market people have no option but anywhere to go um to them so you know it's not as important but it is kind of an interesting concept to sort of think through at any rate as to what could you do to actually turn it over faster and and you know reduce some of those challenges so yeah exactly. i don't know <laughs> and exactly melinda i don't have that kind of spare time <laughs> so. well who uh, i'm glad whoever is running whoever was running that business excuse me did figure it out and was able to fix it well I am not sure it was a deliberate thing so much as a product supply issue, to be honest, but that's okay. It uh, It's worked out for the better anyhow. Agreed. <laughs> so. No, but this way of thinking has a lot of uh, applications. Um, I was working on a project probably 15 years ago, and my client was uh, um, supplying both equipment and software to uh, to their clients and basically they were they were supplying servers and so they had to think about things like uh 
how frequently, how do we batch our emails to people reminding them to reset their password? Because as soon as you do that, bang, there's a whole load of traffic to the servers. And if you don't have enough servers to handle that, people are going to be stuck waiting for an hour before they can reset their password and do any work. So they're thinking, about, okay, so we can batch about 100 at a time and then every hour and so forth. And then some people are going to be late, but, you know, so, uh, you know, some assumptions go in. But and And we were using just equations that some guy came up with uh in the 1930s to monitor traffic coming into you know automotive traffic coming into intersections and how do you manage your traffic lights and the same the same concepts work great for you know anytime you have a bottleneck mm -hmm. and network traffic or or you know lines at the dmv or whatever and um, and people i don't think managers do this kind of analysis the way they should <laughs> no, or at all yeah and the um the course um that i flogged earlier actually includes some of those equations for q analysis so it's interesting i mean i can see the practical aspect of this thing too is i mean you know why do some of the big box stores have a separate till for returns like you said, right? I mean, like one person slows down the entire thing. Well, so let's reroute that customer over to this side here, get them off the side. Now we got our own process over there, but hopefully the rest of the customers can go through. And, and you know, is that part of where some of the self checkouts now come in as well, is to try and you know sort of reroute some of that traffic to take the pressures off others. So it's, I mean, it's interesting. I mean, retail analysis is fascinating. It's not something I've done much of, but um, but yeah, it's it's a neat uh, neat concept to look at for sure. Mm -hmm. And so, if you're at a law firm and you have certain types of you know uh requests or jobs that come in and instead of measuring in minutes you're measuring in days mm -hmm. you can do exactly this the same type of analysis interesting there you go neat um well kurt i don't see any other questions coming into the chat at all so i'm gonna guess that that means that you've answered everybody's questions along the way here or um <laughs> yeah <laughs> i don't I'm, know what I'm, else to say either, on that <laughs> either that or they're just completely befuddled and can't wait for the call <laughs> but um <laughs> but what i and you know again my email address i presented earlier can you welcome to share it um with all of the participants and i guess it'll be on youtube so well yep. um which is which is fine. I I, I figured that would uh, that would be the case. So I'm I'm okay with uh, with folks reaching out and um, you know asking questions about this presentation. Um, my consulting is uh, kind of all filled up at the moment, so I can't take on anything you know beyond what I covered in this course. But if you have specific questions about what I covered here, I'm more than happy to answer them. Perfect. Awesome. Well, on that note, um, why don't we uh, why don't we wrap it up for tonight? Um, I will get the video uh, for this uh, processed and posted up on the Meetup site within the next uh, 24 to 48 hours. Uh, if you are looking for it, there will be a note that uh, gets posted from Meetup to let you know that it's live because I always post there once it is. And um, outside of that, uh, Kurt, thanks very much for uh, for coming and doing the presentation. I can't believe we haven't actually had you here before. I, I, uh, kind of shocks me so we'll we'll try and make sure that it uh isn't um this long until we have you back again and uh yeah i'm looking forward to uh, to seeing everybody else at the uh, next meetup with matt in a couple of weeks so thanks very much bud it's great to see you again we'll you see too. you uh, see you soon